Welcome back here on Live Now from Fox 1114 on the East Coast and 814 on the West Coast. Do want to get back into the developments here coming in out of the Middle East as we do know that Israeli officials believe the younger brother of Yahya Sinwar could be the next leader of the Hamas terror group. Sinwar, of course, the mastermind of the October 7th massacre, was confirmed dead Thursday by the Israeli military killed during an operation, a firefight there over in Rafa. Some high-ranking Israeli officials now telling Fox News that they expect the former sibling, uh, Mohammed Sinwar, will now be calling the shots as Hamas says it will continue to fight against Israel and will not surrender. I do want to bring in Mark Chandler once again to talk more about this as these developments are coming in. Mark, again, this report now indicating through Fox News that this could potentially be the next leader of Hamas. What do we know about Mohammed Sinwar? Well, Mohammed is uh, Sinwar's younger brother. And, and so the, the key here that I, that I want to look at is, is one, he is the commander and was appointed the commander since 2005 of the Khan Yunus brigades. That is one of the brigades that Israel has been fighting since the start of the war, if you will, one of the better brigades there. And he's been in charge of that brigade since 2005. He's been in and out of Israeli jails since the 1990s. And one key factor for Muhammad is that he was behind the plot to kidnap an Israeli soldier back in 2006 that led to the eventual release of thousands of Palestinian prisoners, one of whom was his brother. Uh, so when we look at that, you know, he's he's got that background. He's he's a fighter. I don't think he's as polished as his older brother was, but he's going to bring a little bit more brutality, I think to what we would see as a Hamas leadership. Now, there's a couple of names, other names being floated. Uh, Khalil al Haya, he is part of uh, the leadership, if you will, the Shura Council that's located in Doha, Gutter. And so when I look at that, he has closer ties to Iran. And so if I want to keep that Iranian relationship going, then I'm probably going to look at him. He was also close to Hanea. And if you recall, you know, Hanea was killed in Tehran back in late July. So we're looking at, at perhaps maybe uh, what we were, were going through with a break in of the leadership of the, the fighting leadership and the political leadership. There's some names being floated out of Turkey with some Hamas representatives there. So th this is very dynamic. And I say, think as you go forward with who's going to replace Sinwar, because he took over political and military leadership after the death of Hanea, you may see his brother take over the military, and you may see Haya or somebody else take over the political side and try to either restart negotiations or get more entrenched in how Hamas is going to approach the future. Where does Hamas stand overall? When you talk about organization here of the terrorist group, we do know, of course, Sinwar was killed a few days ago. He was the leader there of Hamas. He kind of called the shots. So where does Hamas stand overall? And do they stand the possibility of essentially regrouping as the focus has been on Hezbollah for the last, I would say, several months? Well, killing Sinwar was one of Israel's primary military objectives in this whole war. And they've accomplished that. And, and that's a significant achievement. However, you know, I want to throw caution out there. That doesn't mean we're going to see peace or an end to the fight. So if, if we revisit what Hamas had, you know, let's say they had 30 to 40,000 fighters at the start of the war when they initiated this fight back in October of 23 with their attack on Israel. So if we look at that, we have seen the methodical degradation of Hamas command and control. Their leadership has been decapitated in, in excellent military operations by the IDF. But that doesn't mean that they've limit, eliminated all of the fighters. So if, if we've eliminated two thirds to three fourths of the 40,000 fighters, you still have 10 to 12,000 Hamas fighters left. Now they're, they're gonna be in disarray. I, I don't have command and control so I'm going to be dis I'm going to have disarray. I'm not going to know exactly how to consolidate my forces and where to focus and fight. So I think we're going to see some some dis uncoordinated, if you will, fighting over the next few days as Hamas starts to regroup. They need that leadership that you just talked about in that first question. So we're going to see that, but I think we're going to see them regroup, and then I think we're going to see them reinitiate some attacks, especially. 
in Sinwar's name to go back and get a little payback. You still have thousands of Hamas fighters scattered throughout Gaza. That's why Israel continually has to go back in and conduct these localized operations. That's not going to go away. They're going to fight more of guerrilla tactics and terrorist tactics, go back to their, their heritage, if you will, and fight like that. So disarray at first, I think a spike in attacks here in the near future, and then maybe after that, you might see some sort of advances in negotiations or something as, as Hamas realizes maybe they don't stand a chance, but they're fanatical, and it's going to be hard to understand and fight against a fanatical enemy such as this terrorist organization. We know from the IDF that there were no hostages that were surrounding Sinwar when he was located. And of course, we've talked about this a lot, but over the last year or so, there have been questions as comments are made that Sinwar has surrounded himself with those hostages and essentially is using them as human shields. So again, to have no hostages that were found there around him, is that overly concerning as the search for more than 100 of those held captive does continue? Continue. Well, I, I don't like this, the, the sign that it sends, uh, Josh. And, and when I say that, we do know Sinwar was around the hostages and he used those hostages as human shields. If we go back to the end of August, when Hamas brutally murdered those six hostages as the IDF was moving in, when they did an when Israel did an analysis of that tunnel complex, they did find Sinwar's DNA in that area. So yes, he was using those hostages. But what I think we saw with the attack this week in Rafa, uh, in, you know, where Israel was able to take out Sinwar, I think what we probably saw was him trying to move around above ground because some of the underground complexes have been destroyed not keeping the hostages with him because they would slow him down. So what does that mean to me? That means that the hostages are worse off uh, than has been estimated. I, I know people don't want to hear that, but I think we probably have fewer hostages alive now, and I think they're in worse physical condition. And Sinwar didn't want to use them at that time because they would just slow him down. He was using moving with a small cell, and I think he was trying to do that for speed to go from one location to another. This is not a good sign for hostages. And he was probably moving from where he had them at one place to another location where he had them and then try to do some command and control. So unfortunately, not a good sign for, for the remaining hostages. I did want to ask you about this because we heard from Russian President Vladimir Putin as he did say that he's been in touch with both Israel and Iran and said essentially he wants them, uh, Russia, to serve as a mediator between the two. Why? And I mean, you can list the reasons, but why is that not likely to happen? Well, I didn't mean to chuckle at the question, Josh, but, but really when I'm looking at Putin start to do this, it's a little bit disingenuous. He's, he's trying to play to the international community and try to look like a good guy who's going to promote some sort of peace agreement. But, but really, he has come down on the side of Iran. That he has a growing relationship with Iran over the last decade when when both Russia and Iran went in to support uh, the the, Syri uh, the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, against the re rebels. And so they developed that military relationship. They have a growing military relationship as Iran supports and supplies weapons, missiles, and UAVs to Russia for their Ukraine war. And now we have Russia starting to look at providing more weapons, and they've done this in the past, but more weapons to Iran. So and when I look at this, Putin is all in for Iran, but he has chastised and criticized Israel throughout. So I don't think you've got a, a sincere appreciation or a sincere offer by Putin. It's He's just trying to play politics, and, and really you can see right through this. This, is, is, this shouldn't go anywhere at all. One more question for you before I let you go. We've talked, of course, about Hezbollah. We've talked about Hamas. And I definitely want to touch on the Houthis because we know that the U.S. actually attacked those underground bunkers just a few days ago that do belong to Yemen's Houthis. I mean, that's a pretty major step, right? Yeah, that is. That absolutely is. We used B-2 stealth bombers based in the United States to conduct that attack. So th that does a couple of things. One, we have done attacks like that based from the United States with our strategic bombers. So that that's 
tells me two things. One, we're trying to keep the tactical assets that are in the Middle East prepared for an Iranian counterattack or to support Israel. So I don't want to utilize those assets should they be needed in a quick me measure. Secondly, I'm sending a message. I'm sending a message to all of our adversaries that the United States, and we're perhaps the only power in the world that can do this, can project and attack you from our home bases in the continental United States. As I said, we've done it against ISIS before in both Syria and Libya. And so to send this message, message to Yemen, I think, is, or to the Houthis in Yemen, I think is also messaging Iran a little bit. We can reach out, we can touch you from our home bases, and we will do so. It's part of deterrence that I've talked about. We need to show more of this, I think, and that'll start to push back on, say, Russia and China and Iran as we move forward in this. But this was a good strike, a good use of our military assets. All right, Mark Chandler there. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to join us here and break down all the developments. Obviously, a lot of them happening uh, this morning and really over the last several hours. Anything else you want to add really about any of this before I let you go? Well, yes, Josh, if I could, just two points. You know, we you you broke this down to talk about the Houthis, the, the situation in Gaza, a little bit with Iran and, and with Hezbollah. I know there's a lot of hope for peace now that Sinwar is dead, but but I think we explain that carefully. But Israel is really fighting on three fronts, and there, it's three battles or three sub-wars, if you will. One is against Hamas, and we can see how that's progressing. The second is against Hezbollah, and the third is against Iran. And so when you look at this, what happens in Gaza may not affect what happens or needs to happen against Hezbollah as we're fighting and trying, as Israel is fighting and trying to push Hezbollah north of the blue line. And then the counter strikes that Israel is prepared to do and is planning to do against Iran opens up that third war or battle, if you will. All of those seemingly not connected and have their own military objectives and national objectives for Israel, but the, the culprit behind it all is Iran and you see how the destabilizing effect. And, and finally, where this escalates to, we know Israel will strike. How I Iran responds to that Israeli strike against, against it will determine whether or not we go off into a, a bigger, broader Middle East war. I don't think Iran will reply strongly. I think they wanna have the survival of the regime, but the future, and stabilizing aspects really depend on how Iran, Iran responds to that. So it's very connected and very overlapped in, in the connectivity that we see across the Middle East here. All right, Mark Chandler, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and help break down the latest developments. We appreciate it. You're welcome, Josh. Have a great day. You too.